Well, welcome everybody. Welcome. Thank you. So glad you could make it. My name is Carl, and uh, I'm a member of Bangsar Lutheran Church with Pastor Thomas. And very grateful to have uh, Pastor Alex be with us, but I'll uh, let Pastor Philip, I mean, Pastor Thomas, uh, <laughs> do the uh, introduction. So basically, I will just get us started and ask Pastor Thomas to uh, introduce our speaker and, and maybe open with a word of prayer. Uh, welcome everyone uh, for this seminar. To this seminar, I'm uh, Pastor Thomas Lowe from uh, two churches. I'm pastoring the church in Bangsa and also Luther House Chapel, which is in SS4C uh, in PJ. And uh, we have co-hosted this uh, seminar and invited my dear friend Dr. Alex Tang to lead the seminar. Now, Dr. Alex, some of you would know him, but I'll just introduce him. He's a wonderful brother of mine that I've come to know in many ways. Uh, he is a very unique uh, person in that he has, he has two disciplines. One in medicine, pediatric. I think that is why he's very patient because you need to be very patient with uh, pediatrics, you know, with uh, forces of chaos. All right, but at the same time, he's also into theology and he really put a lot of his uh, passion in the area of spiritual formation. And he's a very practical man. Uh, he talked about application theology. So he conduct silent retreat, uh, which is quite easy to conduct, right? Because you remain silent. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, in this world whereby there's so much of distraction, noise, and things like that, I think silent retreat really is very relevant to most of us that need time to recenter and to reflect. So he organizes and leads silent retreats. He does a lot of lectures on spiritual formation. And one of the areas we are doing right now is how do we develop our spiritual life in the last quarter of our lives, all right? I think all of us who are attending this uh, seminar, I would assume are at least mid-age and above, uh, all right? And we know that we go through a lot of changes, both physically, psychologically, emotionally. So how do we journey with the Lord in the last quarter of our lives? And uh, Dr. Tang has conducted this seminar quite a number of times. And I keep telling him that I really need to get him. But finally, when we got him, and then MCO came about. All right. But it is a blessing in disguise because once it's become Zoom, we have actually about to date, uh, the last figure I was given was about 224 people. And uh, both our churches are totally outnumbered. All right, majority of you here are from non-Lutheran churches outside. Some of you are from the Anglican church, the Presbyterian church, the AOG church, and so many different denominations as coming together. I think one of the beautiful thing about the MCO is that everybody is much more passionate about learning, uh, learning from home and less distracted, and all the traditional differences uh, become irrelevant as we look to the Lord as our one Lord and Savior. So welcome, a word of welcome to all of you. So glad to have you all here. And I hope that our seminar and the teaching and the sharing from Dr. Alex would really help us in our journey. And today is the first seminar. The part two of the seminar will continue same time, uh, same place next Saturday. Come, let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Our Lord Jesus, we'd like to thank you for this wonderful opportunity of coming together to learn, to listen, and learning to reflect. We commend our dear brother Alex to your hands. We pray for your anointing to be upon him as he shares with us how we should journey uh, with you, especially in the last quarter of our life. Teach us, O oh Lord, and grant to us a teachable spirit and grant to us a heart of joy in the journey of learning. So we commend this uh, seminar into your loving hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Brother Alex, I pass the time to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I just want to thank uh, Pastor uh, Thomas and the churches for inviting me and giving me this uh, opportunity to share some of my passion. Okay, I'm very passionate about spiritual growth. Growth that extends from uh, cradle to grave. Okay, that means from, I, I spent a major part of my life studying spiritual formation or spiritual growth. From the child, newborn, uh, adulthood, and then uh, now I'm, I'm focusing on the elderly. So uh, it's a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here to share with you some of the things about uh, spiritual formation. Okay, and uh, let me share my screen. And here you will see that uh, this uh, seminar is actually for two parts. Okay, the first one will be mainly on mainly on uh, just explaining what I mean by spiritual growth and the seasons of life. So that will lay the foundation for the seminar next week where we have dynamics and means. So the next treatment will be more practical. More practical in the sense that I will give you uh, the type of spiritual discipline that we need to use and how do we build and develop our spiritual life in any seasons of life, not just the uh, late seasons of life. Okay, so. So that's me. Okay, uh, I always wonder to wear a mask. You know, I know, as uh, Pastor Thomas says that I'm into comics. I read comics as a kid. Now actually, I still read comics now. And one of my favorite is Batman. So I always thought that, wow, it'd be cool if one day I'll go to work wearing a mask. And then come the COVID, and now I have to go wear a mask every day to work. Now, these are some of the things that I do uh, at the same time. So, uh, as I said, I'm a pediatrician. I'm a, a civil professor in Monash University. I, I'm involved in the hospital administration and presently involved in some NGOs, especially in this time of uh, the COVID, because I think a lot of people need help. A lot of the poor, the sick, needs help. Uh, basically needs food. Okay. I'm an elder in a Presbyterian church. Okay. My uh, specialty in uh, theology is a practical theologian. I teach and preach and I'm a spiritual director. So these are some of the things uh, I do and people say, oh, you're crazy. Why, why do you want to get involved with so many things? Well, the reason I do, I, I get involved in so many things is that I have this uh, so-called mission statement that what I want to do, and this becomes the focus of my life, is to becoming and nurturing disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay. Becoming first. I have to become a, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Then I want to nurture disciples of Jesus Christ with informed minds. I, I want to train uh, Christians who, uh, who, who do critical thinking, who learn to examine the Bible by the Bereans and, and uh, tease out what is relevant and what is real. With hearts on fire. It means I want them to be passionate, to catch the fire of the Holy Spirit and be contemplative in action. Okay. So the focus here is in the action, not in the contemplative. I'm, I don't want to uh, have people to be contemplative. I mean, it's good for a Christian to be contemplative, but they need to reflect on their action. So basically, this is the mind, 
the heart and the action. And this is my driving focus. That this is what I want to do in my life. And uh, now we all look at this picture. What does this say to you? What does this uh, picture, uh, uh, as you look at this picture, what does it say to you? Does it uh, okay? Who do you uh, identify with? Okay. The elderly lady sitting there, you know, in a, a relaxed posture, looking at the mirror, at a younger uh, picture of herself. Okay. And uh, you look at her and you look at the, uh, which do you, how do you feel as you look at this? You sad, feel sad for the, the uh, older lady or the more matured lady? Do you think that she's looking at her younger self and says, oh, how I wish I'm young again. How I wish I, I have the youth and beauty. God, most of us, as we look at that, think that way too. But what I would uh, suggest is that let's go into the mirror and be on the other side of the mirror. And put yourself in the place of the young lady looking at her older self. How would she think? Where she says, oh, yo, this is what I look like when I grow old. Okay. No. If given a chance to trade places, do you think that she would want to hang on to youth? To beauty? Or you wish that she will be like the old lady or become what she, the old, oldest, her older self. Okay. For the main reason that the older self has gone through her whole life. The older self has experienced the good times, the precious times, but also the bad times. And the older self has Himself, completed the course. While well, she is just at the beginning. Uh, uh, I, I forgot to introduce myself that, yeah, I have one wife, two grown-up daughters, two grandchildren, and three dogs that they think they're human. Okay, so, I, I, I play, uh, I have two uh, grandchildren, one boy and one girl, and we used to play, or we still play mono, uh, snake and ladders. So, in, in a game of snake and ladder, would you want to be at the beginning and number one? Or your, you want your token to be at the end, where you're going to finish the game? Okay. Will, you be, will you be happier if given a choice? Okay. So if you put yourself in the position of the young lady looking at the old lady through the mirror, would it be possible that she wish that she is the old lady? It's something that we need to examine. Need to uh, think about.
She's one of considered one of the three most beautiful actresses. But quite interestingly, uh, uh, in early part in her career, she decided that beauty uh, she's beautiful. She's she acknowledged that she's beautiful, but beauty is transient, it won't last forever. So she spent the rest of her life being a UNICEF ambassador to, for children. So, as we look at this, as we look at the uh, aging, is it something we fear? Is it the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end? Whether it's the end of the beginning of our life 
because you are one step closer to the environment. So as we this seminar will talk about spiritual growth and the seasons of life. And uh, what is spiritual growth? Okay. There are many ways on which we define spiritual growth. Okay. We are growing in Christ is one word we use. No matter from tradition you come, or denomination you come from, we talk about spiritual growth, growing in Christ, spiritual development, becoming Christ-like, nurturing the faith, renovation of the soul, or spiritual formation. These are just describing the same thing about spiritual growth. Now, if I ask you, what, what metaphor will you, will you use for describing spiritual growth? And when you think about the spiritual growth, you know, what comes to your mind? Metaphor, do you think the Bible usually use? Most of us have this concept of spiritual growth as a seed. A seed that's planted and slowly grow into a plant. And maybe even an oak tree, a solid. But if you examine the Bible carefully, okay, and, the, and the Bible uses a lot of uh, agriculture metaphor because the people are, are many farmers. Notice that the Bible actually doesn't talk about spiritual growth. When you talk about the mustard seed, it's actually talk about faith. When you talk about the sower, sowing seed, soil, again, it's faith. It's a growth in faith that is growing bigger and bigger into a seed to a plant. But I don't think the Bible actually uses the metaphor of a seed to a plant as spiritual growth. So how do we understand spiritual growth? Okay. And I want to suggest there's a different way to understand it. And I would like to draw from the resources of creative <laughs> like artists, like painter by sculptors. And you, you <coughs> see, the creative people are the people who can see things from a different perspective. Okay, so in our under, trying to understand what is spiritual growth, we come from we draw on Michelangelo. Okay, Michelangelo, the sculptor. Who, who, who paint the in a chapel, okay? not one of the ninja turtles. Okay. Now, he, he wrote this. He says that the best artist that taught alone, which is contained within the marble shell, the sculptor's hand can only break the spell to free the figure slumbering in the stone. Okay. Let, let me explain what, what he means by that. Now, this is a seven-ton block of stone. Originally built, uh, bought, quarried to, for the uh, cathedral in Florence. Okay, Florence, at one time, in the 16th century, actually was very powerful. Okay, and they're very rich because of uh, their wool industry and the trade. Oh, they want to build a cathedral that is to uh, challenge St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And they did. I mean, if you've been to Florence, you will see a beautiful cathedral. And they decided, yep, like the plaza in front of St. Peter, they want to have 12 Old Testament figures, many uh, offers that go be on the roof. Because if you go to St. Peter's, you see that 12 apostles. So they, they commissioned and they bought all the marble. And the first artist they bought was Donatello, okay, another name similar to the Ninja Turtle. And Donatello did two sculptors. First one was Joshua. Okay. Second one was Hercules. I don't know how that fit into the Old Testament, but the second sculptor was Hercules. 
then he tried to uh, uh, make David out of this marble. But he couldn't. He tried and he tried and basically he just made a hole at the bottom, that's it. And the, they left this marble uh, in the back of the cathedral for about 10 years. And they say, what are we going to do with it? Okay, so they asked a very young Michelangelo, about 26 years old then. And Michelangelo came and looked at the marble and he says, yeah, I can do it. I see David inside the marble. And that's what he, the, uh, the uh, quote by means that he see inside this marble, the statue, the sculpture of David. And he spent from 1501 to 1504, keeping away the age until uh, this appear. Now, because this is recorded, there's always the red dot there. Look, this is regarded as one of the greatest sculptors or, or sculptor of the Renaissance spirit, the statue of David. Okay. And this is what Michael Angelo sees in the marble. Okay. And you notice that most uh, sculptor of David is after his victory over Goliath. Okay. No? But you see that this Michelangelo, look at this and he says that you know, the sculpt, this David is before the fight, the night before the battle. So you can see the tension, the way he stands, the way he holds his hand, and you can actually see the, the veins on his uh, hands and his arm, the tension of his body before the fight. And you cannot see it, but you can see that the left hand is holding the, the sling. Okay, and the face is facing forward. Uh, not a face of victory, a fear face that wondering, will I be alive tomorrow? Okay, and all this Michelangelo sees in a block of stone. And I would suggest that our understanding of spiritual formation, of spiritual growth, is that we are already fully formed. God already made us perfect. And the process of our growth is to chip away the outer layers so that the inner self, the real figure that is in the stone, the marble, comes forth. So that is the uh, way I look at spiritual formation. That God has already created us perfect. Okay? That is our true self. And our job is to chip away the age so that the true self emerge. As in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, And we, who with unreal faces, because we have to unveil our face. Otherwise, we cannot see our real self. All reflect the God's glory. Because we are made in the image of God. And God's image is perfect. So that is our perfect self. Are being transformed into His likeness. With ever-increasing glory. Which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. So spiritual formation is not growing from a small seed into a plant. Spiritual formation is reclaiming what God has already made us to be so that we can uh, become. Okay, So we can become what God has made us to be. John Calvin talks about in the Christian life, we are paradoxically becoming what we are. Christians strive from this identity and not onto it. Notice that this is what he says. The paradox is that we are becoming what we are. We are already made perfect. 
we have a true self. So we are becoming, not that, uh, not we have to strive to be that. So it's a reclaiming and the process of learning, unlearning and relearning. So that is the uh, spiritual uh, growth. Now, Brother Lawrence, when he practicing the presence of God, he talks about, sometimes I consider myself there as a stone before the cover. He also used the same uh, analogy. Wherefore, he is to make a statue, presenting myself before God. I desire him to perfect, to form his perfect image in my soul and make me entirely like him. So, understanding of spiritual growth is to reclaim. It means we have to chip off all the ages, meaning that we have to work. Okay? It doesn't come that naturally. Okay. Now, this is, we have to set, uh, uh, distinguish between justification and sanctification. Okay. Justification is the work of God alone, is grace. We do not earn our justification. Okay, God gave us the grace and we are safe. But in the process, we are also in the process of sanctification. We are growing into Christ's likeness. And that is where we are involved. Okay. So the, maybe the journey isn't so much about becoming anything. Okay. It's about unbecoming everything that isn't really you. So that you can be who you were meant to be in the first place. In other words, we already have a perfect self. There is, at this moment, tower in stone and all that. So we need to slowly chip off the edge so that our real self emerge. Okay. So back to first, second Corinthians 3.18. You find that there are certain important points in this verse that individual and communities are transformed with Christ likeness. So Christ likeness or spiritual growth is never alone. It's always done in community. We have to understand this as we understand as we grow through life, whether we're young or middle aged or old, it always has to be done individually in community. And spiritual life is actually, growth is an ongoing process. The moment we are conceived, we begin the process of spiritual growth until the time we die. Now, the, we are not doing it alone. God has given us the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is always involved in our spiritual growth. And we are in this, the purpose of spiritual growth is to restore God's glory. So that is what spiritual growth is all about. Okay, so we use words like spiritual formation, discipleship, and spiritual growth. Okay, so uh, some of you may be confused about spiritual formation and spiritual growth, but with uh, or discipleship, actually they are uh, almost the same. They just overlap. What is discipleship? Discipleship is actually walking with Christ. Uh, John uh, Scott McKnight talks about in Jesus Christ, a Christian who is radically committed to obeying Jesus Christ, one who studies Jesus' teaching and put them into practice. Now that is a discipleship. To commit to obey Jesus Christ, to study Jesus' teaching and put them into practice. So that is discipleship. Also part of spiritual growth. Okay. Commit to Christ, follow his teaching, and practice his teaching. Obedience. Now, Edmund Chan, you know, in talk about intentional discipleship, okay, about a certain kind of people, committed, that means intentionally committed through a process to produce a certain kind of product. That you want a certain kind of people who intentionally want to have a faith worth having. To have a master worth following, a cause worth pursuing, and a life worth living. 
So that is discipleship. That is our understanding of discipleship. Now, what's the difference between discipleship and spiritual formation? Well, Dallas Willett, okay, is one of the writers that if you, you should read if you want to learn more about spiritual formation, says that discipleship is a decision to follow Jesus to be his apprentice. So it's about positioning. It means you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Okay. Spiritual formation is a direct action <clears throat> of the Holy Spirit on the inner person. So spiritual formation is a process. Okay. But discipleship is the uh, uh, positioning that you want to be a disciple. Okay, so here is a, a diagram about two half of a whole. So if you look at our life, okay, if you look at our life, and uh, let me get the laser. Okay, you find that at birth, spiritual formation starts. It, as I said, spiritual formation starts at conception. And the baby or the fetus inside the womb actually is aware of what is happening. And it's also been spiritual form. Okay. I, uh, in, in my counseling and uh, uh, looking after uh, people, you know, I have discovered that uh, there are people who are, are dealing with uh, rejection, who, are, uh, who are, have problems with uh, forming relationship because of rejection. And the issue arises was actually during their during the pregnancy when they're in the mother's womb when the mother uh, was uh, the mother is of a victim of a rape and she struggled throughout the whole pregnancy of whether to abort the child or not. In the end, she decided, okay, she don't want to. Uh, about the child, but she wants to give away the child at birth. But after birth, the baby was so cute that the mother decided to keep the baby. But she never told the, the child. And the child grew up having problems okay, relating to people. Having feeling that she or uh, everybody is rejecting him. And we find that as we pray and the, the Lord uh, through discernment revealed to us that it was actually during the period that she was a fetus, or he was a fetus. And he felt the mother's rejection of him. So you see, even during inside the womb, we are, a, we are the baby, the fetus is actually receiving input from the mother. And the moment we are born, okay, you find that babies, first thing they do is to learn to smile. Okay, because when you smile, everybody says, oh, so cute. And everybody uh, likes the baby. And they give the baby what it wants. And as we grow as children, one of the things I find is that many of us love our children conditionally. In other words, we express love with we condition. If they, you, they behave a certain way, they score 100 in exams, okay? they obey uh, everything you say, then you give them love. Otherwise, you withhold their love. So we use love as a bargaining chip, as the bride. Okay? And in the Chinese culture, okay, or the Asian culture, we use shame as a, a, a form of... Uh, uh, cohesion or indoctrination. Hi, uh, why can't you be like Auntie uh, Janet's uh, child? No, she's she's so pretty, she's so nice, you know, and uh, she scores do so well in exam, and she plays the piano. Why can't you do that? So we shame our children into the right behavior. And this culture of shame will be part of the spiritual formation. And we carry this into our adult life. Okay. And you find that it actually affects us 
that you know, uh, even in adult, some of us find problems uh, saying that we are not enough, we are not adequate. We must keep on doing things to prove that we are worthy of being. Because somebody says, no, you're not good enough. You're stupid. You are what? So all these things comes into being. So the spiritual formation process actually moves from birth onwards. And you find that actually the two half in a sense that we can develop, we can sort of, sort of arbitrarily di uh, divide our life into two halves. The first half is the development of the false self. And the second half is the development of the true self. Because as we grow physically, emotionally, and socially, we learn that if you do certain things, you get rewards. If you do other things, we get punished. So as a child, you begin to de behave in a different way. You begin to show uh, the, your facial expression. You react in a certain way, which may not be what you are, but you build up a false uh, personal. Okay, there is nothing wrong in the sense that this is part of who we are. This is part of the makeup of the human being because of the effect of sin. That we don't live in a perfect world. So we need to have a personnel to protect us and to give it, get so that we can get what we want. So as uh, we grow in our life, as we study preparation and we start work, career development, marriage, okay, a lot of us produce, uh, develop a very powerful and strong personnel. You find that people who are confident, assertive, tend to get promoted, tend to get better in work than people who are, are very uh, insecure. So, so the insecure person try to put on a personnel of a confident person. Okay, so, so that is a false self. Okay, that is what is a, what we call the false self. Okay, I'll de define that more later. But as you find that uh, the false self to, so that we can have win wealth, develop more wealth, have more wealth, acquire more wealth, acquire status, acquire power. But that is a false self. But somewhere in our life, we have to move to the second half, which is development of the true self. And that is what spiritual formation is all about. Development of our true self. The self that is already created and the self that who God makes us to be. Okay. Sometimes, you, we know that as we grow older, we, we will develop all sorts of physical pain. Okay? We will have anxiety and depression. This is part of life. Okay? We will have grief and loss. We have loneliness and helplessness and living in limitation. So as we begin to move into this part of our life, we begin to be challenged. Our four self begin to challenge. And the Holy Spirit will be working to reveal how to, for us to be transformed into our true self. Okay. And now where does uh, discipleship come in? Well, discipleship only comes in after we acknowledge Christ. After we accept Christ as our, fail, our Savior. Because before we know Christ, we cannot be a disciple. We cannot be a follower of Christ if we don't know who he is. So discipleship actually occurs in some part of our life. Okay, that means all of us have to find Christ on our own. Okay? Even though you grow up in a Christian family, okay, you have to develop your own faith, not your faith for your parents. So but here, but after we know Christ, then we begin Christian spiritual formation or discipleship. So that's where it comes in. Okay, And then the whole idea of discipleship or spiritual formation is to help us to develop our true self. So we still face all the issue. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you do not face issue, but you move. We have the Holy Spirit to help you. Okay. So that is basically 
what this uh, spatial formation. So you, Romans seven says, okay, uh, it is important to realize that. To the true self, Romans seven. Yeah. Romans seven actually talks about. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin and work with it. So we know that we actually have two selves warring between us. Paul is describing it very graphically. We have our false self, our old self, and our new self. Okay. What a wretched man am I? And who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Thanks to God who delivered me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So this formation is moving from the first half of the false self towards the second half of the true self. But we still struggle. We still struggle uh, going through, but it's something that is part of it. And, I, and if you look through the, the Christian uh, literature, and we must uh, realize that we have 2,000 years of the rich Christian heritage. Okay? It doesn't start with the Reformation. It was there all along. And we can actually learn from many of the church uh, teachers of the church. Okay. We have uh, here two of the 36 teachers of the church. St. John of the Cross, or John of the Cross, talks about the ascent of Mount Carmel, which is talking about spiritual growth. Or the Teresa of Avila talk about the interior castle, where it says that the, our spiritual life, our life is like a, a castle, like a diamond, and there are 10 mansions in it, and we move from one mention to another. Okay. And uh, of course, we are familiar with John Bunyan. Okay. He's a Puritan. Okay. Okay. We are Pilgrim's Progress. Okay. So there are people to, writing about the Christian life, the spiritual life. Okay, I'm not saying all that. Let me define for you what I understand the spiritual form. Spiritual formation or spiritual growth is the intentional. Okay? That means it's an intentional work. We have to be one to grow. We have to want to work to grow. An ongoing process of inner transformation. <clears throat> so it's an ongoing process of inner transformation to be like Jesus Christ himself. To become with others a communal people of God and to become an agent for God's redemptive purpose. So in this definition of uh, spiritual formation, there are three parts. First is the internal, intentional and ongoing process to be like Christ himself. Okay. Then we want to become a people of God. And we want to be an agent for God's redemptive purpose. So the goal or spiritual growth or sanitation is to be like Christ, become a people of God, and establish the kingdom of God. Okay. So fundamentally, it's actually to be conformed to the likeness of Christ, to be Christ-like. Okay. And that is the purpose of our spiritual growth. Okay. To become our true self, which is like Christ and to be relying on, on the role of the Holy Spirit. God gave us the Holy Spirit to help us to grow. Okay? We, don't, we don't have to do it in our own strength. Okay? The means of growth are the spiritual discipline we use. Okay? We do formation, but the transformation itself comes from God, comes from the Holy Spirit. And spiritual growth is personal, community-based, uh, sorry for typo, and mission. And faith is a lifelong journey. So whether we like it or not, 
we are on a journey of faith, of growth. Now, Will Hot, James Will Hot talks about every life, spiritual growth is an ongoing process. It's a lifelong process. Okay? It, and he says that it doesn't matter okay, uh, whether you're Christian or not, all of us undergo spiritual growth. But spiritual, uh, at, there are certain elements in our life that actually influence our growth, either positively or negatively. So that's why we need to help our children, we need to help our friends by introducing positive influence into their life to help them to grow and not add negative influence which distort their spiritual growth. Okay, so again, the three components which I like to term person information, which is the individual component, persons in community formation, which is the people of God, and persons in mission formation, is to complete the mission of God on earth. Yeah. If you read through the Bible, you find that God wants to achieve His purpose through human beings. I mean, God can do, you know, He is God. So He can actually change the world just like that. If you speak out, the world will be perfect. But you find that God wants to make the world perfect through human beings. So that is part of our spiritual growth. Okay, so I just want to skip a few slides and give you this uh, diagram which shows that what I'm trying to say in a nutshell, the three components of spiritual growth, person in formation, person in community formation, and person in mission formation, which is to rest the person in formation is to restore the image of God so that we can become Christ-like. The persons in community formation is that we want to be in commune with the Trinity God so that we become a people of God. And the shalom and the kingdom of God is where we want to be the kingdom, uh, uh, persons in mission formation. So we establish the kingdom of God and the healing of all creation. So the key to spiritual formation or spiritual growth is basically the Holy Spirit and human volition or human will. So it is a partnership. The key is a partnership between us and the Holy Spirit. We want to grow, the Holy Spirit will help us. Okay? We don't want to grow, the Holy Spirit will not force us. But we will come into life situations where we will be forced to grow. And basically, you look at growth. They are first level growth and second order growth. <clears throat> first order growth is actually behavior growth or behavior modification. That means if you join a church, they will teach you, after a while you know what, how to behave correctly. But that doesn't change you. The second order growth is that when you become somebody else. Okay. I mean, this, uh, I like to share about a friend of mine that has been a drug addict for many, many years. Okay. Every time he goes in and out of rehab, and within six months, he's back to rehab. Because he felt that, oh, I need, I need the drug, I need the high, you know, I become very anxious without it. And then one day, suddenly he, he, he doesn't need a drug anymore. Okay. Before that was first order change. In the sense that change in behavior, behavior don't take drugs. He fought against it, but he always failed. Second order change is when the Holy Spirit transformed him. When the Holy Spirit transformed him, he doesn't need the word drug. So ask him, how come you, you, you're not back again? He says, actually, I don't know. I don't feel the need to take the drug. So that is what we want to achieve in spiritual growth. That we become our, our true self and we go into we become somebody else. So who is this true self and false self in God? The false self is a created one. <clears throat> the false self is the me I've created to get by in life without God. 
and to get my needs and needs apart from him. Okay, for the true self is the original that God created and intended what I am now in Christ. The false self, security and significance is achieved by what we have, what we can do, and what others people think of us. Okay, a lot of the false self is actually what other people think of you. While true self, the so security and significance is achieved by being deeply loved by God. Happiness in the false self is sought in autonomy from God and through attachment. Okay. True self, the fulfillment is found in dependency on God and surrender to Him, living our vocation. Okay. The identity for the false self is who we want other people to think we are. Who we want other people to think we are. And in the true self is that who we are and becoming in Christ. And we look at the false self, it's maintained by means of pretense and practice. Okay, so it takes a lot of effort. And it takes a lot of effort to keep on telling lies, to, uh, to be a hypocrite. Okay, it takes less effort to receive it uh, and, be, and be your true self, be authentic. So you find that the false self and the true self are different and we are moving from one to the other. Okay, so, <clears throat> so if you want to have biblical reference, the false self the fallen image of God, the old man, the old self, old nature, the heart of stone, flesh, and natural man. <clears throat> so the Bible does talk about this with transformation from the false self to the true self. And that is the basis. You see, you see that it's always we add on, we build on as we go along. So Second Peter talk about faith and to faith goodness and then to goodness you add knowledge then knowledge self-control to self-control you add perseverance and godliness and mutual affection and then love so all these are process process of growth process of movement so when I talk about the two half are they equal half not really because some of us may move from the false self to the true self earlier in our life. Some of us later. So it's not equal halves. But all of us will be moving from the false self to the true self. Okay? As we, especially as we grow older. You find that as we grow older, as we grow uh, uh, older in age, you find that there is this innate movement from our, our life or our desire that we actually move towards the close of self. Okay, so it's not midlife crisis. Okay, it doesn't mean that getting a red collar or a new car, a new lifestyle. No, it's not midlife crisis. It, it involves a period of reassessment that you find that there's something wrong with your life that you need to change. Okay, and sometimes it's triggered by certain factors like, you know, uh, something happened, you lose your job, okay, somebody close to you die, or, you know, somebody close to you, or you yourself have cancer or some other disease. Okay, so there is a, you will feel challenged as you move into the second half of life. Okay, and then you find that Second half of life actually have three, three uh, parts. The early second half, the mid second half, and the late second half. Okay, so as you move towards your true self, to discover true self, you find that 
the early second half, early second half is that deals mainly with your past. That means you re-examine your first half of life. As you re-examine your first, first half of life, okay, you find your past, you face your path, you praise your past, and you let go of your past. That means we need the first half to complete the second half. That means you build the first half and then you renovate the first half. We unlearn the things in the first half and then you learn the thing to become the second half. Okay. So that's why I want to explain this so that the next uh, seminar I'll tell, give you the tools to build all this. Okay. So you find that the first part of your late seasons of life, so specific, okay, is that you have to address your past. Then the middle of it is to assess your present, to find your true identity. Who are you in Christ? To grow in authenticity. Okay, do you, do you bother so much about what other people think or about who you are? Come to terms with the reality. Okay? And reflect on faith journey and on relationship. And then you go on to the late second half where we discover our vocation, consider our legacy, develop our partnership with God, and to look ahead. Okay? So you basically talk about the Place in the past, the goal of this part is to arrive at a place of acceptance by honest reflection and realism. That's looking back at the past, at the first half of life. Then the middle part is the transformation as a person. Okay, that's where all the chipping is done and then you, you reveal your whole self and you are being transformed by the Holy Spirit through healthy self-examination because we have hope then the future is ministry maybe you're surprised that you know we're talking about the end of life you know should shouldn't we are talking about retirement or or uh, uh playing golf and all that but you find that the second half the last part of the second half is ministry to discernment, what we need is inspired action. Okay, so there is a role to play in the second half, the end of the second half. So for the first part is dealing with the past. Okay, so I I, I just go to, uh, so I don't want to go into detail. So I'll send you this PowerPoint and all that. Okay, but you find that the even as we go into the second half, there are challenges. Okay, you know people say that uh, just aging, but there are also vices of uh, aging, as uh, Paul Stephen says. Okay, you we can we can pride can be a problem in the second half as you grow older, because we still the old man is still there, the old self is still there. Okay, envy is there, wrath is there. Okay, slot. Okay, slot is a whole town. Trouble is, uh, labor is troublesome. Okay, also lazy. Okay, many of us thought that oh, uh, old age retirement is to do nothing. But I think that there is also a role, and we are still learning, still going through the process of spiritual formation. Avarice, gluttony, and lust. Okay, and then. Going on, uh, so we are talking here. We are in the second half, second half of the uh, uh, middle of the second half, which is growing in authenticity. How do I live with my changing self? So as you you grow older, and you begin to recognize your your false self, and you look for your true self. I think yeah, that's, that's why the place of suffering is there. You know, as we begin to suffer, as we 
have problems and issues, we begin to realize that we depend a lot on our false self. And we need to discover who our true self is. And many of us do not like our false self. Okay? Many of us do not like ourselves. But we have to learn to find out who is ourselves. And as we measure in, in faith, what is our relationship with God? We, that means we have to reassess our relationship with God and what are we to do with our new faith? So here are some of the images or metaphors for the second half. Okay. Wrestling with God in the belly of the whale, a grain of wheat falling ground, burping process, caterpillar, crystal, uh, list and butterfly, dark night of the soul. All these are ways people trying to describe that in the process of life, we discover our true self as we grow older. And then we reach the third, late uh, second half, okay, where we have this calling. Well, we, already we have to discover who are we, what is our real self. Okay? And, and we know our gifts. We know our passion. So it's very powerful when our identity and our gifting and our passion comes together. Okay. Now, we have a calling or we have a mission when we're young. You know, some of us have a, a passion to be pastors and all that. But as we grow in the older in the second half, okay, we also have the passion. There's also a second calling. But this time, we can do better because we have the life experience. We have the resources. We have the connection. And we know who we are. And we know who God is. So there is a time where there is significance that the end of the, the late seasons of life is not the end. It's the beginning of a new chapter in our life. Okay, and more so, how are you to help the other people? Okay, by mentoring, by spiritual direction, okay, or even start uh, starting a new ministry. Okay, and then uh, I want to uh, finish uh, by a, a few minutes by uh, dealing with uh, just superficially with uh, uh, three things which I will develop more in the next seminar. Retirement, slowing down, dementia, and how to die well. No, I know we, we, we Chinese don't like to talk about die. Okay, but death is an important part of life. Okay. Do you no, know, we don't actually as Christians we don't talk enough about dying. How do we die well? Okay, so well, as as uh, in in record in John, when uh, Jesus was, I mean, I asked him, uh, Jesus talk about, talk about this. Is this uh, actually he's talking about John's death? But I think it's very relevant to us as we grow older in life. It's very I say to you, when you were younger, you dress yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand. And someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Okay. He's actually talking about uh, John, but I, I, when I was doing the lecture, I find that it's a very powerful image of the spiritual life. That when we are young, we, are, we think that we are in control. But as we grow older, we have to learn the process of letting go. Okay. So, Somebody will address you and lead you where you want, do not want to go. That means you have to learn to let, let go. And I think that here we, have to, we are in control, but as we grow, as we grow in our spiritual life, as we become more and more of our true self, 
we discover that actually more and more our true self is about letting go. Letting go and letting God decide what to do with us. I mean, obeying God. So, yeah, we can talk about retirement. Okay, you find that there are some interesting things that you can discover about retirement. That, yeah, uh, housing is a, a, a challenge for others. Okay. Now, work will not end. That's a quite interesting finding from the States. This is actually from the States. It simply changed. Okay. Many of us think that retirement is just uh, sleeping until 12, 12 o'clock, wake up with the newspaper until 4 o'clock and dinner. So, yeah, all playing golf. But how many golf can you play? You, know, you travel, how many countries can you visit before you become bored? So you find that a lot of people who retire actually do something else. Work doesn't end, it just change. Okay. And you find that people who say, oh, I, when I retire got time, I will do more volunteer work. Now, research has found that if you do not do volunteer work now, you will not do volunteer work after you retire. Health issues, yes. As you grow older, you feel younger. And initial disappointment will give way to later satisfaction. So more about retirement next uh, uh, seminar. But does the Bible talk about retirement? Yes, we do. The Bible actually talks about retirement. This is in numbers, applies for the Levites. Okay? Men 25 years and all, more shall take, come to take part in the work at the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. By the age of 50, they must retire from the regular service and work no more. So the retirement age in the Bible is 50. They may assist their brothers in performing their duties at the tent of meeting, but they themselves must not do the work. And this tent is how you assign the responsibility of Levites. So there is retirement, but if you look at what the job of the Levite is, is that they have to assemble, put up all the pillars and all the uh, paneling. And then after that, after they start moving, they have to take it down. So you need young, strong men to do it. So it makes sense to have the retirement age and yeah i mean we, we have to recognize that our strength and energy goes down with age but it didn't say that once you uh you don't uh the older people okay after 50 their job changes they are still involved but not in building the tabernacle but to continue to serve as guards ensuring the sanctity of holy place. So they are still involved. Only thing is they're not involved in taking down, building and taking up, and building and build, uh, taking down the tabernacle. And that is something for us to consider. Okay, that is uh, retirement. How do we see retirement? And dementia. And the dementia is something that we have to deal with. You find that many of us, I mean, we are all aging. And the, the number of uh, people over 65 in uh, Malaysia is growing. So dementia is a problem that we need to be aware of. Dementia is a word we give to a set of symptoms affecting different aspects of thinking and brain function that get worse over time and affect the way we live our lives. Dementia is not a normal part of aging. It is the result of physical diseases that damage the brain. Everything that makes us who we are, our personalities, intelligence, emotions, our hopes and our fears are driven by this incredible organ. The brain is the most complex structure in the known universe. Intricate networks of brain cells bundles of nerve fibers, a 
and hundreds of miles of blood vessels all work in careful unison to keep us ticking every day. Every second of our lives, nerve cells in the brain are firing. But when these cells become damaged and their connections start to break down, a person can develop dementia. The area of the brain where this damage occurs determines the symptoms a person experiences. If nerve cells in the back of the brain are damaged, a person's vision might be affected and they may have trouble reading words or climbing stairs. If nerve cells in the side of the brain are damaged, communication and language skills can change. There are four main diseases that cause dementia. The symptoms of these can overlap, sometimes making them difficult to tell apart. While each disease has characteristic symptoms, these can change from person to person depending on which areas of the brain the disease is affecting. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. Often, one of the first areas of the brain to be affected by Alzheimer's is the hippocampus. The hippocampus controls aspects of our memory and navigation. So, forgetfulness and getting lost are usually some of the first symptoms of Alzheimer's. In Alzheimer's, nerve cells are damaged by a buildup of two proteins in the brain, amyloid and tau. These proteins are present in all of our brains, but in Alzheimer's, they behave unusually and begin to clump together. Researchers are still trying to understand what triggers this, but it's likely to be a mix of age, genetics, and other factors such as poor heart health. The buildup of harmful proteins is also a key factor in other diseases behind the condition, like dementia with Lewy bodies and frontotemporal dementia. This damage spreads from one area of the brain to another as the condition progresses. So symptoms get worse over time and people begin to find more aspects of day-to-day -day life difficult. Dementia with Lewy bodies can affect different areas of the brain, leading to a variety of symptoms including changes in attention, sleep problems and hallucinations. The processes involved in dementia with Lewy bodies are similar to those involved in Parkinson's disease and people with dementia with Lewy bodies can also develop Parkinson's-like symptoms such as shaking and slowed movement. Vascular dementia can occur after someone has had a stroke or the blood vessels in their brain are in poor health. While the other diseases that cause dementia spread steadily through the brain over time, vascular dementia can progress in distinct steps after an event such as a stroke, slowing a person's ability to think, plan and pay attention. Unfortunately, there is currently no cure for any of the diseases that cause dementia and no treatments that can slow or stop the spread of these diseases through the brain. Researchers all over the world are looking for new ways to tackle these diseases and protect precious nerve cells. Their work has the power to offer new hope to millions of individuals and families whose lives are affected by dementia. To find out more, search Alzheimer's Research UK. So, Alzheimer is a, 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 a real issue, okay? But Alzheimer, Alzheimer or dementia is not part of uh, aging, or it's not aging, okay? Doesn't mean that everybody will get Alzheimer. But one in 10 will, the rest of us will age without Alzheimer, okay? So basically, the 10 warning signs are memory and uh, challenges in facing problems, Difficulty in completing familiar tasks, confusion with time or place, trouble understanding visual image or spatial. Okay, so basically, these are our problems with memory. Okay, new problems with words, speaking, writing, misplacing things, decreased work or judgment, withdrawal from work, changes in mood. All, all these are actually basically loss of memories. Okay, I, I just want to skip to this the mild one. And come to this, how will our faith be if we lose memory? Okay. So if we slowly lose our memory and we can't even remember who God is, do we still remain Christian? Do we lose our salvation? That's an important thing that we uh, have to think about and surprisingly I do not find any theologians engaging with the issue 
does faith requires memory. Now, personally, I do not think so. I think that even if you're with dementia, you do not remember who you are, God still remember. Okay. God still remember who you are, no, no matter what you do. Because, I mean, you, God knows who you are before you are born. God will know who you are even if you have dementia. Okay. And I just want to talk, uh, just uh, close by talking about dying well. How do we end well? Dying with dignity. Now, this is a book I wrote a few years ago. A Good Day to Die. And I put it right in front of my clinic. So if you enter my clinic, you know, the first thing you see is a good day to die. Okay. Interesting if you enter a doctor's clinic and you say it's a good day to die. But what I argue in the book is that a good day to die is a day when God decides that, yes, it's time for you to come home. So how do you die with dignity? In the next seminar, I'll deal, go into more detail about retirement. How do we deal with uh, dementia and for dying well? So I think I've just finished my time and I could uh, give it, send it back to our moderator. Yes. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Was I not? Was I muted? Did you hear me? Yeah, we hear you now. Okay. Sorry. I, uh, so we do have one question uh, for uh, Adeline, actually. Do we need to register again for next Saturday? I think the answer is no. You're registered for both events, but Adeline can contradict me if I'm wrong. Why don't we take a few minutes to uh, for some questions as we're at the end of our time. Uh, you're welcome to type them in or speak them out. Um, you, you can unmute yourself. Any questions? Uh, one request to uh, share the slides. Yes, I, I can share the slides. I can, I can pass it to uh, Adeline probably, and then she can pass it along. Uh, share the slides with you. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? Any uh, points that you want to clarify? Oh, one request. Uh, can Dr. Alex share his own journey into a second half? Maybe that's something, something for you to consider, Dr. Alex, for, for next week. Well, I mean, uh, basically the second half is, uh, started off when I'm uh, uh, 40, 50, and then I begin to realize that uh, actually I have achieved what I want to achieve so what makes and then uh, so I went through the process of uh, and uh, asking myself you know, I, I, I'm 65 now so when and what is the 
So, I'm going through the process. It's a learning process, but I'm learning to, I've, I'm learning to let go. It seems like your mic has kind of gone out, Dr. Alex. Um, but I did catch that you're learning to let go. Yeah, let go. <laughs> Is it better now? Yes, maybe you let go of your mic. Okay, I got the mic. Now, I, I, it is a process, I think. Uh, my own process is that I uh, have to examine my past and also, uh, also my present. And also, actually has a lot of, to do a lot of uh, inner work. That means, uh, uh, actually, I ask the Holy Spirit to help me to sort of uh, deal with one uh, thought at a time one character flaw or one false self component at a time. So, yeah, it can be difficult and it is difficult sometimes to face yourself, face your delusions and that you want to hang on to. So, the major lesson I'm slowly learning is to let go. Thank you. So, yeah, I'll just read a few more questions. Uh, where to get the book in the PJRK area? I guess um, maybe I'll stop there. And... Which book? Probably the, the one that you last mentioned, the, uh, what is it called? Oh, Dying. Oh, that one will Erased. be uh, Canon Land, Canon Land uh, Bookstore, they would have. Hmm. Okay, I mean. Where is that? Uh, uh, Canon, Canon Land? Yeah. Nah, okay, but I mean, you. Uh, you can get it at Amazon.com, but I, I wouldn't advise you to go there. It's too expensive. Uh, okay. Yeah. So actually, I'm uh, been asked to do a revision on that. So if you can wait a while, then uh, the ed second edition will be coming out soon. Mm. Okay. So there's another question that I can answer. Can new people who haven't registered yet join in next Saturday? Uh, <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, that's fine. Just uh, just register, please. Another question, is there any nutrient that can prevent dementia? Uh, there is no nu nutrient at this moment that uh, can prevent dementia. I mean, one of the nutrients that, uh, one of the vitamins that we use to treat people who, are, who have evidence of dementia is vitamin E. Okay, vitamin E supplement, but this is more for to slow down the process. But at this moment, there are no supplement to prevent uh, dementia. Okay. Uh, is it possible to reach, to, to one never to reach the stage of finding one's true self even through the end of life? I, I think it's, uh, that there is a lot we don't understand about uh, death and the uh, no, uh, and uh, the perfection that the resurrected body. Okay, so the resurrected body is actually our true self. So I, I believe that the, there is a, a process where we will find our true self by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I don't believe in the, there's a purgatory or something like that. But I believe that the process of uh, spiritual uh, sanctification goes on. Okay, until we die. Okay, is there any other question? Memory so law? There, there were two others that uh, came in earlier. I'll read both of them. Uh, how can the church tap on the experience and skills of the seniors in ministry? And does the Bible use words like put on or put off for the struggle between the old man and the new man, the role of self. So that question plus, how can the church tap on the experience and skills of ministry, mm. of seniors in ministry? Yeah, I, I, I believe that all churches should be intergenerational. That means uh, we need to tap on the resources and the wisdom and the uh, ability of the older folks and the younger folks. Okay, it's not just the middle group that we are interested in. Okay, unfortunately, most churches are interested in the middle group. Okay, but 
I, uh, the older folks have a lot to offer and the younger folks too. So I think a balanced church would be able to do that or should be able to do that. And uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, mentoring, in terms of uh, uh, this future direction, okay, we, we actually don't need titles. Okay? We don't have to wait for create positions. The older folks can actually befriend the younger ones. And the younger one can also befriend the older one. So we can have a, a type of sponsorship. Okay. I think that the concept of uh, being God parents is important. You know, why don't we, you know, every child that is born uh, in a family, in a, in a church, gets a pair of God parents. Maybe the older couple that has more time so they can share and help in the uh, uh, parenting of a child. That's one possibility. Okay, is that a question? Yeah, well, it's uh, now 12.10. Perhaps we should close it up. I did get a question of how to, how to exit. Basically, you can tap on your screen and then you'll see the upper right hand corner if you're on a phone anyway you'll see the upper right hand corner which is leave just click on that uh, i see lots of comments like thank you and so I'll, I'll sum that up by saying thank you so much dr alex for sharing thank with you. us today and we look forward to continuing this next week thanks for everybody for joining us what a blessing to have everybody participating please pray for yeah, for all of us to remember what's, what we heard and to, to find those little things that the Holy Spirit has specifically for us to apply for ourselves. And, and I will just uh, close us in a, a brief word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness uh, to us through your word and through Dr. Alex today. Please help us remember the things that you want us to remember and apply them appropriately and even share these gifts with others as we seek to have your kingdom grow in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.